Okay, hi. I'll try to speak uh, loudly and clearly and slowly so you are sure to understand everything I have to say. Uh, it's really a great privilege and honor to be here and I appreciate you taking out your time to uh, hear me out today because we're really going to go outside the box. Are you ready for that? Okay. Uh, so I like the title of this uh, series, and uh, it's appropriate. Uh, I want to begin uh, just by asking three or four of you uh, a question. And I want you to think somewhat deeply about it, but I only need a two, three-word answer. One might do. So this will uh, happen very quickly, and we'll start from that. And I just want to ask you, uh, start with you. Who are you? Who are you? I don't want my name. I don't want your name. I don't want your social security number or email. I want you to think about something that describes you in a deep, descriptive way. Okay, well, you have various roles that you play in life. Are you a father? A professor, a Christian, a Muslim, okay. What would you say is most important? So along that vein, a father, okay, a father. How about you? Who are you? Interesting. No one knows who they are. <laughs> There's so many different answers. Right. What? Give me one that's important to you. Is right. If someone were to say to me, "Who are you?" I would say, "Easy question." I'm a writer, a philosopher, and an activist. Who are you? I'm a student. You're a student, okay. That's good enough. And we'll do one more. Who are you? Yes, you. Uh, I'm human. I'm a student too. No, no, human. I'm human. Yeah, this is solid. Interesting, okay. Because that's taking me to where I want to go. <clears throat> because usually we will say that we are um, a male, a female, a feminist, an anti-racist, a radical, a conservative, a homosexual, heterosexual, male, female, Christian, Muslim, professor, student, something like that. And that's how we identify ourselves in the world. But rarely do we think that we are a human. Uh, and that is because we, we take this for granted. Now, if I ask you, who are you as a human? Of course, the answer has to be that I am an animal. Specifically, I am a primate. Or in Jared Diamond's terms, I am the third chimpanzee. The common chimpanzee, the bonobo, and homo sapiens. Who are you? I am homo sapiens. I am a human being. I am a human animal, as opposed to a non-human animal. So the question I want to raise is, who is homo sapiens? Who is the human being? What is the human being? How can we know? Do we know? Do we have any idea of who we are as individuals of a given species? Now, humans have been thinking for quite some time on this planet. Language evolved 40 to 50,000 years ago. Philosophy is at least 2,500, 3,000 years old. Uh, we certainly have a rich history of philosophy, theology, and science. And I want to say something provocative just to start with. We have not, until recently, had the slightest idea of who we are as individuals, of an animal species called Homo, sap Homo sapiens. We have not had any clue who we are. And so that's the paradox. A lot of verbiage, tons of books, all the world's great thinkers, and everyone was wrong. No one got it right, almost no one. Some people got glimmers of the truth. 
But most all the thinkers in the Western tradition, and I would add mostly the Eastern tradition too, got this question wrong, completely wrong. And so we've grown up, we've been miseducated into this fantasy ideal of who we are as an animal. And we have been told some very flattering things, but it proves that they are, are almost all wrong. Now, I don't mean uh, any slight to people who are religious, but I don't think religion can answer this question. Philosophy uh, has a lot to say in terms of its critical capacities. Ultimately, uh, this has a lot to do with science. It's a scientific question. And the science of Homo sapiens and the history, archaeology, anthropology, genetics, paleontology, etc., um, are, are starting to become sophisticated enough that we have a glimmer of who we are. We did not have a clue until 1859 when Darwin published Origin of the Species that we were animals that evolved like all other animals. And although there were ideas of evolution that go all the way back to the pre-Socratics, it was really only in 1859 we began to think accurately about who and what we are. So that's the paradox. Homo sapiens, wise man, not so wise, able to understand lots of things and even master the complex technology but only recently gaining some knowledge into who we are as a distinct or unique species. That's the paradox. And now there's an irony. The irony is just as we are about to learn who we are, just as we begin to look into that mirror and see an accurate reflection, we are starting to change. And the world is starting to change. We live in a world in crisis where our own existence is in peril. Our closest biological relatives are about to go extinct. And we will lose a lot of potential knowledge about our evolutionary past and our biological nature if that happens. And if we have a nature, and that's one of my questions, do we have a human nature? If we have one, is it changeable? Because the irony is, it seems we are on the threshold of having the capacity to change our nature, if indeed we have one. Now, I consider myself uh, a leftist in my politics. Uh, I began as a Marxist, I uh, evolved more towards an anarchist position. But from the left tradition, you see, there's no such thing as human nature. Because that's a social construct, and people are different in different societies. And leftists don't like to say human nature, because that implies something negative. And that usually is associated with conservative values. Human nature. Human beings are violent. Human beings are competitive. Human beings are hierarchical. So the order that we have today in capitalist society is perfectly natural. It reflects our nature as animals. We can't change it. Don't even try to change the status quo. We are status quo seeking animals. So the question of human nature has always been bound up with right wing or conservative values. But as I started thinking more about this, I could see that the uh, left wing response to this was a fantasy a humanist fantasy. Our evolution as animals goes back five to seven million years ago. We climbed out of the trees in East or Central Africa into the savannas. Our bodies began to undergo some dramatic change. We stood up on two feet and uh, became bipedal animals. Uh, the first form of that is called Australopithecines. We evolved from Australopithecine to various types of Homo. That's our genus, Homo. And that took us to the current point. That happened five to seven million years ago. Now, if you believe 
that we can live for five to seven million years before we even evolve a language. And you don't think we have a human nature, a basic nature within us. I think you're deluded because we are not infinitely plastic. We are not able to be shaped into anything. We have an animalic past in us that runs back five to seven million years ago. So we are fundamentally animals. Whatever sociological or cultural overlay we put on that, we are animals with a basic nature. And the more I looked into that nature, uh, the, more, the less attractive the human species seemed to me. Now, so I say we have a nature, but I'm going to also say it is, being so, it is socially constructed at the same time. And I want to begin with uh, the, this irony that it seems like even if we have a nature, we are about to change it. We have pharmacology, the science of drugs, Medicine such as Prozac, which can change your personality, can change your sense of self. And so uh, neurologists and, and, and scientists are asking the old philosophical question, what is the self? Do we have a self if we can take a drug and change our personality? So we get into the brave new world type of scenario where we engineer human personalities through chemicals and we become different human beings. We have cloning. Cloning actually is not very radical, it's just weird. You replicate yourself, uh, you don't modify human nature, you just uh, create a copy of it, so to speak. We are using cloning techniques far and wide in agriculture uh, and also uh, with, with plants. We have genetically modified plants, genetically modified farm animals, and then we clone the best of that lot. And uh, these animals are programmed to become as large and fat and grow as fast as possible to supply the insatiable demand that human beings have to consume the flesh of another animal. Uh, I don't think it's impossible that we could use genetic engineering on ourselves. We have been hesitant to use cloning on ourselves because the uh, death rate of cloning animals is incredibly high. The failure rate is very high. But it's quite possible we have experimented with these techniques. It's quite possible there is somewhere an island of Dr. Moreau where there are mutant forms of life, part human, part monster, if you will. It's entirely possible. We can create hybrid species. We can take the cells of a human DNA, put them in a petri dish with the cells of a cow and let it grow for up to two weeks legally in some countries. And they're doing this in Korea and elsewhere. That's a hybrid, that's a different kind of species. What happens when we create the human Z? Half human, half chimpanzee. If we create such an animal, what, what, what would that be like? If we can genetically modify our nature, do we have a basic nature? So you see, there's lots of advances in science and technology that even if we have a nature, allow us perhaps to alter this. And so you have the, the example of the film Gattaca, uh, where human beings uh, have split into two branches of evolution. You have the normal types, like all of us here, and then you have the modified types. And the modified types are the ones with the extra powers, the athletic powers, the additional brain power, and you have a new caste, a new form of discrimination based upon genetic superiority. So these are all possibilities. Now, so although I believe we have a biological nature, I've said it is socially constructed. That means the way we have interpreted ourselves as animals uh, is a social, cultural, and linguistic product uh, it goes back to the beginning of language 40 to 50,000 years ago. We have never stopped thinking about it. We have thought about it in different cultures and different languages from different perspectives. Uh, and we have come to basically some very similar conclusions. Homo sapiens is an animal that is considered to be radically unique. Now, that's redundant. 
because by definition a species is a species that is unique from other species. So to say that human beings are unique, as people like to say, it's to say nothing. Of course we're unique, a squirrel is unique, a rat is unique, a dog is unique, by definition. But somehow, we are so unique, we're different from all these other animals. Radically different. And we are unique by defining ourselves in a certain way, and that is as a rational essence. And this has been so well articulated in the Western philosophical tradition from Plato, to Aquinas, from Aristotle, to, uh, to uh, Descartes, Kant, and, and beyond, we still think this is common sense. We are the rational animal. Now, we began to construct ourselves as a certain type of species, uh, I would say, with perhaps the first and one of the most monumental revolutions in history. If I ask you, what are the main revolutions in history, you might say industrial capitalism. Actually, industrial capitalism is a variation on a theme. The theme is agricultural society. Agricultural society emerged 10,000 years ago. And it emerged when we made that shift from over 90% of our history, from hunting and gathering tribes that moved nomadically, uh, that lived off of the bodies of, scavenger, of scavenged animals or dead animals. That's how we ate a lot of our meat. We didn't hunt it. We, may, we maybe hunted small animals. We gathered a lot of crops. There's this idea of man the hunter that is a myth because we haven't always been hunters. Uh, man has not played so important a role in history that we can ignore what women have done as gatherers. So, agricultural society, which I'll come back to, was a, was a clear rupture. And I think it, it was a growth-oriented society, and capitalism is just a variation on that. But perhaps the turning point in history occurred 60,000 years ago, and that is when we began to uh, develop organized hunting. You see, throughout most of our history, we were not hunters, we were the hunted. We were not predators, we were the prey. We are very weak, frail animals. We lack claws, we lack sharp teeth, we can't run very fast, we're very weak. The only thing we had going was something called a forebrain that was barely uh, developing. But once we developed a spear, we could line up uh, in a, a group of 10 or 20 around a large animal and take that animal down. These animals that used to take us down, we began to take down. And soon extinction crises spread all over the planet everywhere we went because we killed without any sense of limitation, without any restraint. So uh, that, I, I emphasize that because we began to define ourselves apart from other animals. We began to define ourselves not as a part of nature, but apart from nature. And that is a very important part of our identity and how we have constructed ourselves as human beings. We don't consider ourselves to belong to the animal kingdom, or if we do, in such a way that um, we are just radically unique. We don't consider ourselves to belong to the natural world. After all, we've created culture, which is the antithesis of nature in our minds. But beginning with agricultural society, when we began to domesticate the wild, take plants and, 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 and grow them, not just uh, take what they gave to us, but to actually grow wheat and corn and other crops uh, through uh, artificial selection, as we came to call it, and to take animals like goats uh, and later uh, cattle and sheep and to domesticate them to turn them from wild animals into domesticated animals for human labor purposes. The domestication of the wild defines agricultural society. And we have done this ever since. So we began, you see, to get a sense of our power over other animals, to get a sense 
that we could manipulate nature and not only be manipulated by it, that we had a special kind of power that made us different from the world and from other animals. Now understand, we used to revere animals. We used to live in uh, uh, very important psychological relationships with animals. You look at early cultures, they're called totemic cultures. That means their identity as a tribe, as a people, came from an animal. We are the bear people, we are the wolf people. The cosmos was populated with spirits. It was an animistic world. It was alive with souls. And we were one soul, commingling with all other souls. But soon we lost our reverence for animals. Soon we began to exploit them and dominate them. Soon they became the largest slave class in history. We used them for food, for transportation, for labor for clothing, for every imaginable purpose. And we define ourselves apart from them, and they were no longer sacred to us, but objects, resources, property, and commodities. So I suggest this, that we got this idea that we are rational beings, Homo sapiens is a rational animal, by sharply distinguishing ourselves from other animals by saying that these animals do not have the abilities that we have, they do not think rationally or logically, they don't have languages. So our essence is to be the animal that has rationality and language. And we define ourselves as that type, and so we are radically different from all nature and all other animals. And that's what I call the politics of human identity. Because you see, who gets the count as human in this world? That matters a lot. That first hierarchy in history was speciesism. We dominated animals physically. We exploited them as slaves, and we defined them as inferior to us because they lacked rationality. The first philosopher of slavery was Aristotle. Things took the wrong turn in history with Aristotle. The first, one of the first philosophers, Pythagoras, you see, was an amazing man. He was not, he's mostly known for mathematics. But much more important to Pythagoras was his theory of diet and his ethics of equality for all life. He insisted that we had no right to injure, kill, or harm other animals. Uh, so he was what we would today call an animal rights activist, although of course the discourse did not exist. He insisted that the best diet for the human frame was a vegan diet. So on the one hand we had the Pythagorean tradition. That continued through Neoplatonism, through the Romans, through the Stoics, and into the medieval era where it was utterly suppressed. It was revived in the early modern tradition by the 17th century. Pythagoreanism as a diet, as an ethic, was considered some of the leading knowledge of the time during the early enlightenment. That other tradition in Western history was the Aristotelian tradition that said that the universe is constructed in terms of a system of uh, teleology or purposes, that uh, it is arranged as in a hierarchical form such that the lower beings serve the needs of the higher beings. So, so Aristotle said, just as plants serve the needs of animals, so animals serve the needs of human beings. And the most perfect type of being was the most rational being. So short of God, we were the highest and most perfect forms of life because we were rational. We were the rational animal. And that thought goes through medieval thinking. Uh, it goes through the early modern tradition. And this is how we have defined ourselves. So no matter uh, where you look in history, as soon as people begin to uh, write, uh, as soon as uh, the philosophers begin to think, 
<clears throat> you find uh, a certain continuity, a certain pattern that whether it's ancient society or medieval society or modern society, uh, whether it's Western culture or Eastern culture, whether it's philosophy, theology, or science, you find the same thing. We are radically unique to all other forms of life, and we are superior. And in most cases, they exist to serve our purposes. Our purposes are uh, quasi-divine and unquestionable. So there are continuities in what I call the dominator culture. Uh, and so um, by the time we arrive in the 16th century, we had a worldview that was very well established. Now, what I want to do is uh, give you a, a, a graphic of what this worldview was and how it became dismantled, piece by piece, and how we reacted to this and, and where we are now. You might be very familiar with this kind of diagram. The medieval worldview, the Christian medieval worldview, can be seen as a series of concentric circles, with God outside the universe, transcendent, in space and time, having created the universe, <clears throat> and at the center of the universe, of course, is the Earth. At the center of the universe, in terms of value and importance and divine focus, of course, is uh, humankind. And I'll put man here, because this is a patriarchal picture, literally man. Women were considered closer to nature than to culture. Um, and uh, the essence of man was reason. Let me say something about that real quick, by the way, that the essence of man is reason and that led to other forms of uh, hierarchy. Because if we say that our essence as humans is rational and we can identify a certain class of human beings as less than rational, they're less than human. You go through Western history uh, books and reread what the greats had to say, and they will, will mostly uh, uh, conclude that women were deficient in rationality. Rousseau, for instance, said women are, have practical rationality, but not theoretical rationality. They can't be philosophers. It's, it's nonsense, but this is how uh, the classic figures thought. So if we can say women don't have rationality, we can say they're subhuman and they, they belong at the bottom of a hierarchy. If we can say people of color, people from Africa, if Europeans can go on colonial missions and say, these aren't rational people, they're animals, they're savages, they're beasts, they're subhuman, then we can put them in the category of animals where they have no value and we can do anything we want to them. And there is no moral question about it and every time there's a war, first the enemy has to be reduced to the status of animal. And this is part, again, of the politics of human identity. Who gets to be called human and what are the consequences of that? Notice we are talking about an error, a mistake, an illusion. Because it was Nietzsche who taught us that as soon as human beings begin to think, they immediately make mistakes. They immediately make mistakes in cause and effect and all the different fallacies that uh, you identify in logic class. They immediately think to posit God, uh, they anthropomorphize, sun god, moon god. They immediately think that uh, somehow they're privileged in the universe. They have uh, irrational fears, etc. Some of these lies are corrected and vanish forever. Some stay with us. The lies that stay with us, the errors that we retain, are the ones, he says, that have utility. They serve our purposes, our pathetic psychological purposes to be demigods on this earth. So any philosophical error that we have created that says that we are rational and that we are special and that everything exists for our purposes, we have retained those errors. So, beginning in 1600, 
This old picture was dismantled. And you know the story, just quickly to go over it. So we, uh, we find a series of what I call discontinuities. A discontinuity is when this picture is torn. And you see, we have a need for meaning, order, and pattern. So if some rude scientist or philosopher comes along and says, this is false, and creates a hole in the fabric, we're going to find a way to repair it. So the Copernican revolution came along first and foremost and said, uh, uh, and, and uh, with the beginning of the scientific revolution, 1600s, that uh, this, the earth is not the center of the universe. That's a geocentric worldview. The sun is at the center of the universe. That's a heliocentric uh, worldview. And that idea was fairly uh, destabilizing. It, it was decentering. There was a discontinuity, a break. That's not what we were taught. This seems to mean we're not favored or privileged in some way. If we're not at the center of the universe and the sun is, and we revolve around the sun, and the sun doesn't revolve around us, this is uh, an uncomfortable uh, thought. Well, we know that there's no center to the universe at all. There may be parallel universes, for all we know. Uh, we do know, uh, in Carl Sagan's words, that we are nothing but a pale blue dot. Uh, in this incredible cosmos. Now, his findings, uh, his mathematics were all wrong. He was more tied to the medieval era than to the modern era he helped to begin. Galileo came along with uh, new technologies, uh, telescopes to confirm his findings. Of course, he was forced to recant. And so this hole was left in the picture. I'm only going to read you one quote. Uh, a short quote, uh, just to give you an example of how we would respond to this, this, this type of destabilizing crack in our universe. Because there's a problem here now if we're not at the center and we have thought ourselves, flattered ourselves into thinking everything exists for our purposes. Because we're going to repair any damage and fix this picture until it is put together with scotch tape and rubber bands. There's a historian named J.D. Barry who wrote a very nice book about the history of progress. Quickly, he says, after the Copernican Revolution, finding himself in an insignificant island floating in the immensity of space, man decides that he is at last the master of his own destinies. He can fling away the old equipment of final causes, Aristotle, original sin, the Bible, and he can now reconstruct his own chart. He is bound by no cosmic scheme. He need not take the universe into account, except as he judges it to exist for his own profit. So look, this is like when Nietzsche said, God is dead. Do not be depressed by this knowledge. Be exultant, because never has the sun shone so brightly on any sea. Now that God is dead, man can be born. We can create a humanist culture and get rid of this mediocrity that Christianity has imposed upon us for millennia. So this was kind of repaired. Or we turned a disadvantage into our advantage. Humanism, instead of receiving a proper punishment it deserved, humanism became even more arrogant. Hey, now the whole heavens, the whole universe, uh, is something uh, that we can master. We, we have no limitations. Now, people uh, could be fairly comfortable with, comfortable with that. Comfortable, that is, until 1859. Because uh, in 1859 was the Darwinian Revolution with the origin of species, and Darwin so rudely came along, and he was so hesitant to say this, he sat on the manuscript for <laughs> over a decade because he was frightened of what the consequences might be, the subversive knowledge that we are not at the center of the universe. We are animals who take our place side by side with perhaps uh, over 10 million other species, and we evolve according to the same laws of natural selection, of sexual selection, 
We evolve for no special purpose. There is no teleology. Uh, everything is accidental and, if you will, self-organizing. That knowledge uh, was highly disturbing, and people to, to this day reject this. It caused uh, the war between religion and science like never before. Notice the difference. In the medieval era, very close to Aristotle's picture, there was something called the great chain of being. You had at the top God, below God angels, then man, animals, plants, minerals, rocks, etc. On the earth, of course, we were master and we were uh, exceeded in perfection and intelligence only by disembodied, pure, uh, rational or soulful spirits. So you can see this linear model of, uh, of, uh, of ontology, of the nature of the world, pla places us up at the top. Indeed, most theories of progress do the same. So what uh, Darwin did uh, in Stephen Jay Gould's uh, metaphor was replace this ladder with a bush. So now we have a picture that looks like this. And all of these lines represent different species. Call this the primordial pool of life, if you will. What life does is speciate. It creates millions and millions of species, all different. And so now here we have Homo sapiens alongside all these other animals. And we have no special place if you just shift the metaphor. You can see this is really much more radically uh, uh, disconcerting than uh, Copernicus. How are we going to deal with this? Darwin also said uh, that animals are different from humans in degree and not kind. He wrote two very important books on uh, ethology, which I'll talk about soon, the study of animal intelligence. He said, animals have more intelligence than we have yet to understand. We have falsely opposed ourselves to the entire animal kingdom. We are different in degree, but not kind. And the way I would put this is everything we have within us, every moral impulse, every feeling, every thought or potential thought was given to us by evolution, by our animal ancestors, by our primate uh, cousins, and by other animals. How do you fix the terror in this picture? Well, first, if you're a scientist, you ignore what Darwin said about animals, humans being like animals, different in uh, degree, but not kind. You ignore that and you proceed with your vivisection and your speciesist species exploitation, because scientists conveniently overlook that or will emphasize difference in kind over difference in degree. If you're a capitalist, this was perfect. This fed right into the dominator worldview. Because now we have this idea that competition is essential for driving life forward. Now, in truth, Darwin emphasized cooperation as just as important as competition. Somehow that got left out. So uh, capitalists took Darwinism and turned it into social Darwinism. And that was the dominant ideology of the capitalist class in the 19th and 20th century. That life is brutal, violent, and competitive. And those who are the fittest, by the way, Darwin never even coined that term, the survival of the fittest. Those who are fit will survive. And if you cannot compete in this world, then you do not deserve to live. So Darwinism became uh, appropriated by the, dominant, the dominator culture as an ideology to justify class domination and uh, social elitism. And the whole idea of might is right came about that became a fascist ideology and people said we may have evolved from other animals but we are special because we clawed our way to the top. And we're special because we have the technologies of power we have the weapons, the guns, that can kill uh, and control uh, life uh, as we choose. So 
Darwin got reappropriated into the uh, dominator culture. And that whole, although it exists, was trying to be patched together and somehow to keep the worldview intact, the dominator worldview. Well, of course, in the same century, along came on the heels of Darwin, Nietzsche and Freud. Nietzsche and Freud said <clears throat> they destroyed the Cartesian dualism between man and animal, between body and soul. Uh, Nietzsche said, um, body am I entirely. I do. And towards uh, Descartes' cogito, I think, therefore I am. Nietzsche says, it thinks, therefore I am. In other words, what Freud called the unconscious mind was fully anticipated by Nietzsche, indeed the romantics. And uh, we are now told that we are animals. We are dominated by irrational impulses, by desires, by instincts. Uh, that we do not understand, that we cannot control, and we are not rational animals. So uh, what Freud and Nietzsche did was to turn this around so that we are not defined as the rational animal, but as a desiring animal. So uh, again, a very common representation on the Freudian model. Uh, rationality is just the tip of the iceberg, and below this is animality. Everything we deny that we are, everything we try to suppress, and uh, all of the dark elements of human nature, including Thanatos, the death instinct, the, uh, the instinct toward violence, destruction of life, destruction of others, destruction of the self. So we are not a rational essence. Uh, we certainly do not have a soul. How can we fix this picture? Well, Nietzsche got appropriated by the fascist. Uh, the idea of the Ubermensch, uh, the Superman, <clears throat> became the German culture. Uh, and uh, Nietzsche was no anti-Semite, and this was a grotesque distortion of his work. Freud, interestingly, was divided. Freud was uh, half anti-enlightenment, half a pro-enlightenment. Because Freud says, we can master this through rationality with science. That science is psychoanalysis. So Freud said at the, at the very same time, we are not captains of the ship. The ego is not the captain of the ship. But it could be made to be if we gain self-knowledge through psychoanalysis. So we had uh, uh, to do some damage control. The repair was basically fixed. Okay? Now, one more revolution that came along that's uh, worth noting commonly is the revolution of uh, artificial intelligence. Beginning perhaps uh, by the 1950s, of course, through the present moment, computers became more powerful, ever faster, ever smaller. Uh, they began to interface with our bodies. Uh, they clearly could outperform us in certain tasks. Uh, when a Russian chess master loses to a computer in a chess game, you know that in some sense a machine uh, is more intelligent than a human being. So pretty soon we're going to find ourselves as humans bounded by intelligence on both sides. On the one hand, we're going to learn that other animals have intelligence, have minds too, and that machines have kinds of minds. We are not unique in having minds or intelligence. This was fairly easy to control, although it haunted our subconscious. Because after all, we created computers. We're the smart people who created these things smarter than us. Uh, and uh, there's a group of thinkers, if you don't know about their work, you might find very interesting. <clears throat> They're called transhumanists. Transhumanists are uh, almost neo-Cartesians. Some transhumanists are merely interested in longevity and any technological device that will enhance and extend our life. Some go so far as to say we can have immortality by transferring our consciousness onto a computer tape. The body is superfluous. We should have no nostalgia for the body. Give up the body. It's an old, broken down, carbon-based mechanism. Don't need it. 
The essence of us, in other words, again, is thought to be our mind. And you can put your mind on a computer tape and live forever. People literally uh, are seriously pursuing this idea. Um, so you see, somehow we could uh, control this without uh, being too upset about our special place in the universe. But if you look at science fiction, you can see that we are subconsciously f afraid uh, that we are creating uh, something superior to us. You look, for instance, at the uh, uh, Stanley Kubrick movie, 2001, where Hal, the computer, becomes defiant and says no and disobeys uh, the orders uh, of the uh, space engineers. Well, in 2010, we learned that it was just a computer malfunction. So Hal wasn't so threatening at all. You look at the film Terminator 1, Arnold Schwarzenegger is this frightening monster from the future, this machine that has come to destroy us. So, you know, we have these fears that, that objects, machines, will take over, that we cannot control these. And what happens in the sequel? He becomes a house pet. He becomes fully domesticated and not scary at all. You look at the Matrix 1 and 2, uh, these robots, these objects, uh, they are going to kill us, they are much more powerful, uh, uh, we, cannot, we cannot defeat them, uh, we're, we're going to be destroyed, become extinct. And I think I was the only person in the audience rooting for the robots. Because I want to see one movie, just one, where we lose. <laughs> Because you can see, we can't lose. We have to reconstruct the fantasy that we are superior. We are un unconquerable. We are, are not finite. We are infallible somehow. So, of course, what happens is that we uh, defeat the machines. And so, uh, that quickly is a way of uh, describing some of the conceptual revolutions, beginning with Copernicus all the way up to uh, artificial intelligence. <clears throat> and uh, up to the present moment where we have had really serious challenges to this construction of human identity that ultimately took this, this form of the medieval worldview, at, at least in Western culture. And you see a pattern here. Okay? The pattern is this, that any time there was a, a, a break in this, we'd have to mend it. We clearly are narcissistic animals. We clearly uh, are guilty of what Freud calls infantile regression. We have to feel that we are at the center, that we are of supreme value. We have to have hubris rather than humility. We don't understand humility. We don't know how to take our place side by side with other beings in this world. We don't know how to think of differences except in terms of hierarchy. This is one of our fundamental problems. We, we can't appreciate differences for what they are. Everything has to be turned into a hierarchy. Now, I just want to describe um, one other revolution that has come about. Uh, and uh, then I'll move to some quick conclusions and, and we can uh, discuss a little bit. <clears throat> so you see, we haven't had a very good idea of who we are. Every time we get close to the truth, we resist it. And we begin to socially reconstruct who, who we think uh, we are or need to be. Uh, by the 1970s, paleontology, archaeology, anthropology had really advanced. That's when we started to understand that we are five to seven million years old. This was confirmed by the Human Genome Project in 1992. And chimpanzees are our closest biological relative that we share 95 to 99% of our genes with chimpanzees. Chimpanzees are closer to us genetically than they are to orangutans. Remarkable. And um, our animality, therefore, we had scientific knowledge that uh, our animality went very deep into the past. So notice, we're starting to understand some things about ourselves. We understand evolution, now we have genetics, uh, we have uh, sophisticated dating techniques, uh, archaeology, anthropology had taken quantum advances. We're beginning to understand who we are. 
as an animal, where we came from, and uh, uh, how we're uh, similar and how we might be different. But in 1980, a new scientific uh, discipline emerged that uh, is absolutely revolutionary, and it's called ethology, or cognitive ethology. It was started by a man named Donald Griffin, and it's continued today by a host of thinkers. One of the most popular writers is named Mark Beckoff. Ethology tells us that we have made, we can summarize the mistake, Nietzsche's big mistake, right, where we, we make intellectual errors. We can summarize uh, the error of human thinking over tens of thousands of years in this way. We have greatly underestimated the intelligence of other animals and greatly overestimated our own intelligence. In fact, we are so unintelligent. We are so biased, we are so discriminatory, we are so dogmatic that we did not begin to even have a clue that other animals have minds. Darwin saw it, but really until uh, 1980. And through various scientific experiments, uh, not like vivisection, but in the field, setting up uh, tests or challenges to an animal to see if they can figure it out, uh, and if they can solve this, we know that they have a certain kind of cognitive capacity, okay? Uh, through certain uh, various forms of science and, uh, uh, and empirical observation, behavioral studies, we have come to the conclusion after four decades of cognitive ethology that uh, we in fact seem to differ only in degree and not kind with other animals. We have said that uh, we are the rational animal. But other animals have minds. Uh, they have thinking capacities. They can solve problems. Uh, they have remarkable uh, spatial uh, senses and, and memories. We know that a chimpanzee is smarter than a four or five year old child. Did you know that a chimpanzee is smarter than your average college student in some ways? The chimpanzees have outperformed college freshmen on spatial analogy tests. You remember those tests you had to take to get into graduate school, the ones I always failed? <laughs> Chimpanzee consistently outperforms college freshmen in understanding the analogies of spatial shapes. When we gave chimpanzees American Sign Language or lexigrams, we gave them a way to open their minds to us. So we learned that behind that, that furry brow was another mind like us. And they were able to communicate thoughts to us in language and feelings and emotions. That they were hungry, that they were lonely, that they want to play, that they want to rest. And they could even tell us some kinds of stories. Now, there's a lot of debate. Is this really a language? Okay, uh, my name is not... Noam Chomsky, I can't really settle this debate here for you, but it is highly debated, but whether it's a language or not, it's certainly a human uh, arbitrary imposition on the chimpanzee. This is a mind, and this mind has a capacity for complex communication. And so we always said that we are beings who speak who have language, and now we see other animals have kinds of languages, dolphins, have signature whistles. Hi, Bob. Hi, Joe. Whales have these complex forms of uh, communicating that I think we're just beginning to understand. In my area, in uh, New Mexico, Colorado, we have an animal called the prairie dog. The prairie dog uh, has like 150 different words in its vocabulary, all for different animals. Uh, and there's one specific one for human probably something like a uh, warning, delusional, dangerous animal in nearby vicinity. So uh, Alex, the gray parrot, um, Coco, the gorilla, um, so many famous cases of animals with complex vocabularies, some sophisticated forms of communication. So uh, ethology is the science of the complexity of animal psychological existence, emotional life, and their social worlds. We know that they have fear, 
We know that they have joy. We know that they have sorrow. We know that elephants feel grief. We can almost deduce this by the fact uh, that they bury their dead and they seem to grieve. Now, we can make mistakes, understand? We're anthropomorphizing here. So when you see the chimpanzee in the movie like this, looks like it's happy, that means the chimpanzee is frightened. We can misinterpret these things. So as scientists, we, we have to screen that out. But it's, it's pretty, pretty well understood that uh, elephants uh, can sense grief, that uh, they have post-traumatic stress disorder, like soldiers do, when hunters come in and kill their families, or they hear killing uh, in a nearby part of the African forest. Um, there's a case of Coco the gorilla, who had a, a, a kitten, who grieved for weeks after her kitten died. And Coco clearly was saying, me miss, me miss kitten, me miss cat. Where's cat? I, don't know. I love cat. But we have to see that these animals have the, a wide range of emotions. They have complex forms of uh, thought and uh, complex forms of language. For instance, if uh, you put a banana on, on, on a rope and you scatter some boxes around and uh, you put chimpanzees in the scene, they want that banana. Now, if they're instinct governed, if they're stupid, they'll just look at it. Instead, they look at the boxes, they look at the banana, they look again. <laughs> what if we put these boxes on, on top of each other, climb up, and just grab that banana? There's videotape of that. There's videotape of crows figuring out how, how to lift up uh, food from a rope by using its feet. Solving problems. There's examples of animals solving problems. There's a thinking mind going on here of some kind, certainly. No, it doesn't build spaceships. No animals don't write poetry or philosophy books. But no, we don't have echolocation like the bat. We can't run with the speed of a cheetah. We're not as graceful as a gazelle. We don't hear with our feet like elephants do. We lack all kinds of amazing qualities that animals have. We single out one damn thing that we're not even very good at, rationality. And we say that is what makes us masters of the universe. That is what justifies fur farms, vivisection laboratories, slaughterhouses, aquariums, zoos, circuses, rodeos, every exploitative barbaric institution of enslavement we have ever created. And this hell of an earth for animals we have used our mind for that purpose and we have justified it according to the fallacy that we have reason and we have reason alone and that that is adequate for exploiting all other forms of life. So let me uh, just uh, conclude. This idea I, I tried to quickly explain here that we have a human nature biologically. The way we have understood it uh, through social and linguistics and cultural constructions has always been wrong. We have flattered ourselves in the most pathetic ways and it's time to really look at who we are. Science is self-correcting, ideally. Uh, science is often a prostitute uh, for bio-pharmaceutical uh, capital or the military, but ideally science is self-correcting. In this case, science is self-correcting. Science is helping to correct the errors science helped to perpetuate. And we are learning now that we need new taxonomical tables. We are learning that we belong to the same family, the same genus as, uh, for instance, other primates. And some people will want to bring primates into the homo genus. I say, hell, we bring human beings into their genus, call ourselves Pan, P-A-N. That's the name for the, gym, the primate genus, Pan. They're not homo, we're Pan. If you want to get it really right. So the taxonomical tables have to be redone. And the uh, non-species scientists, the ones who can think without bias, are redoing these. And this is not just a philosophical mistake. There are profound moral and ecological implications of this mistake. 
misconceiving who we are as animals. Morally, uh, you can see that we have used uh, our false identity as a rational animal uh, to really, the only word I can think of is holocaust, to create a holocaust on this planet that is the most ongoing, uh, the, has taken the most, the greatest toll of victims in the most horrific ways and continues to show no end, it continues to grow exponentially. Ecologically, the error is profound because we have defined ourselves apart from the natural world. We created the illusion we could control and manipulate it without consequence. And uh, now we have genetic engineering and we think that we can redesign plants and animals as if we are gods uh, and in, the, in this sense that we are omniscient, that we can understand the full consequences and ramifications of what we're doing. And we can't and we don't. Aldo Leopold, the ecologist uh, in the US uh, in the uh, mid 20th century said only a fool tries to distinguish between what is essential and inessential in nature. So you may think the worm is inessential, the dung beetle is inessential, the pollinators, the butterflies and bees are inessential. Let me tell you, they are so much more essential to this earth than we are. And we are the only species you can pull out of this ecosystem. This earth will heal and not, not succumb to a weakening process and not start to crumble because everything is so interconnected. So there are profound moral consequences of this mistake. There are profound ecological consequences of this mistake. And uh, because of the combination of our arrogance, our alienation from the natural world, our loss of respect and reverence for life, our loss of a sense of connectedness to our brothers and sisters and cousins in the animal kingdom and uh, the entire world itself, we are now in crisis. That uh, illusory identity, in addition with growth-oriented societies, now capitalism, is taking this world apart. So now we live in a very unique era in time. We live in the era of climate change. This is unprecedented. We live in an era of the sixth great species extinction crisis. Before our eyes, try to understand this, before our eyes, we are losing species at 1,000 to 10,000 times the natural rate of extinction. Try to understand that there were five extinction crises before now. They're all caused by nature. The last extinction crisis was 65 million years ago. That's when the dinosaurs were wiped out, when arguably a meteor hit the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, all of uh, half of the existing species went extinct. And that gave mammals, maybe a little tree squirrel we were back then, a chance to fill that ecological niche and to become the gods that we think that we are. So we are in crisis on this planet. We have a social crisis. We have an ecological crisis. It is planetary. The scientists are telling us we have a narrow window of opportunity to change. Some say it's three decades, some say it's three years, some say it's already too late. There's a tipping point. You pass the tipping point, all you can do is, is, is brace yourself because the winds of change, the furies of hell are coming. And by the end of this century, we do not want to be alive. Pity the people who are because they will be dealing with the consequences of this disastrous worldview of these incredible errors and illusions. Uh, because by 2050, there will be 9 billion people on this planet. By 2050, the Arctic ice will probably have melted. By 2050, the oceans will be dead without fish. And uh, some say 100 years after that, we might be gone. So we need to rethink our identities. We need to do a lot. We need a lot of revolutionary change. We need moral revolutionary change that can come through animal ethics, 
environmental ethics, I would insist this would be animal rights, not animal welfare. We are equal to other animals in that we are an animal, we are sentient. That's what matters, not reason. That we can feel pain like animals can feel pain, that makes us equal. We all have the same interest in not feeling pain and not being tortured and not being held captive and not being killed against our will. We have the same interest. It's fundamentally equal. We need a moral revolution. We need a psychological revolution. We need new identities, new worldviews, new maps, new values. We need a social revolution. I don't know what your politics are. But for me, that means we, can't, we have to dismantle this capitalist world system. This system is based upon a grow or die imperative. And we can only grow so far. We've exceeded the limits of growth. That's another fantasy we've evolved into believing is true. That there are no limits to growth. And that science and technology can fix any problem science and technology creates. We're looking to science, technology, and free markets to correct the problems that science, technology, and free markets have created. And we don't want to change our psychologies. We want to hang on to these pathetic, desperate, uh, fallacious, uh, humanist, uh, speciesist, anthropocentric identities. We live in a community we don't understand. Uh, the community is not uh, Europe. The community is not northern, uh, the northern hemisphere. A community is not the human race. That's the best that humanists can do. We don't belong to one race, we belong to the human race. Oh, what a fine sentiment that is. And how pathetically inadequate. We belong to the, to the sentient community, to the community of pain. We share with other animals. And we are animals and we belong to their world. We're part of their world. And ultimately, we belong to the whole physical earth because it is the rocks and the rivers and the plants that made the atmosphere. It all works together, the functioning of the planet for every breath that we take. Animals play a fundamental role in sustaining the planet. So we don't belong to the human community. We don't really even belong to the community of pain. We belong to the bio-community. We belong in one word, what the Greeks called Gaia. We belong to the earth. And I have to say this finally. We think the earth belongs to us. But to repeat, we belong to the earth. And as soon as we get that, we have a chance of survival and a chance of ending this holocaust and this war that we have waged against all life and against ourselves. Thank you. Thank you for the speech. The speech was a little longer than announced because I was asked by a colleague to let Professor Best speak right. out. So now we will have like 10 minutes uh, for questions. But afterwards, at 6 o'clock, uh, Professor Best is uh, giving another speech in Kino Udarni, which is like from here. And you can then go there, and maybe there'll be, there will be more time. So please, now, uh, questions. Yes. I, I would like to uh, start with the, the fact I uh, noticed. You started with a, with a rhetorical trick question. Uh, by asking people um, who they are, because uh, this is uh, uh, okay in nowadays culture. It is uh, it is understood uh, as uh, as a as a question that uh, that needs uh, an answer about um, a particular person and his uh, um, how and whereabouts, which is uh, which is not uh, actually uh, true. Uh, the the question who are we or who are you or who am I is, is actually only answerable uh, in, in a religious uh, um, uh, or uh, I would rather say in um, Cartesian dualism uh, um, um, way of thinking. Uh, 
Oh really? If we're not dualist, then this question is not answerable. It's not because uh, the, 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 the answer, who am I, implies a person. Not a particular person, a person, something substantial, not something changeable. And, and something that uh, undergoes uh, um, some fluent, um, I don't know, some dialectic uh, and, and so on and so on. Uh, this was, this was uh, the, the first thing I, I've noticed. The second thing, uh, Germans in, in the time of uh, uh, Nacio socialism didn't think Jews were irrational. Because even then, and especially in the 19th century, Jews were some of the, 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 the best thinkers uh, uh, in the German uh, society. They didn't think that. They wanted to get rid of them because they didn't think they were any much of any animal. They, they thought they were the same as animals. Because all the people are, are, are only um, some sort of dispo, uh, uh, disponated matter. And this is the, the very same um, kind of idea that comes out of your thinking. I'm sorry. Oh, you don't have to be sorry because, first of all, you're wrong. <laughs> uh, we'll start with your second question. I didn't talk about uh, the Jews. Uh, it's an interesting point you make, um, you talked about Holocaust. but uh, let, let me tell you, I, I gave you a general model uh, that it often works this way, and you can find counterexamples. It works for ableism, the idea that some people, uh, because uh, they don't think in a normal way, uh, that they belong in some kind of special uh, uh, boarding house or something, or they're not fully people or persons. Uh, the scheme works in various ways, and since you raise the question of uh, Hitler and the Nazis, uh, uh, in fact, uh, you can find paragraphs, long words, where the Jews and other people were denounced as rats, vermin, dogs, and even bacteria. So this corroborates my point and not your point. Not exactly. So the animal model, uh, the idea that uh, everything that is not human uh, can, can be eliminated um, uh, it, it holds up in this case. It's a little different because uh, it's, it's more of a eugenics metaphor here that there's a gene pool that is being contaminated by bad blood. Uh, and, but it's, it's, it's related, okay, because the discourse of eugenics was very important there. Now, uh, your first point that we can only think uh, dualistically uh, is, is wrong. Uh, dualistic thinking is a fallacy. In philosophy, we call it the either-or fallacy. It's like there's no third choice. Um, so to think culture versus nature, to think men versus women, to think human versus non-human, misses the evolutionary continuum of life, okay? So it's not either or, it's maybe both and, or degrees of development. You mentioned the word dialectics, that is dialectical thinking versus dichotomous or binary thinking. So uh, let me answer your question since you asked it. So dialectical thinking is understanding the, the, the continuum of evolution, the continuum of subjectivity and consciousness through life. That is hardly a binary form of thinking. Uh, now, I think maybe your point is this. If we go to Claude Levi Strauss, uh, we can say that we understand language or the world by categorizing it, by making kinds of dualism, by saying cat, not rat. We understand cat because it's not rat. We understand cooked because it's not raw. So Levi Strauss showed that how we construct the world in terms of series of oppositions. The question is not do we have oppositions, human, non-human, male, female, culture, nature, but do we construct them as opposites, or is it a flu is it a distinction, not a dichotomy? You want to uphold dichotomous thinking. 
I want to dismantle that for dialectical thinking. So maybe we're on the same page if, uh, if you're thinking uh, that point. But there is no defense for dualistic thinking. Uh, it is a fallacy and an error. It's, but dialectical thinking is an oxymoron. Dialectical there thinking is not a dialectical thinking. Dialectical thinking you di is not dualistic thinking. If you read Marx and Engels and any dialectical thinker, they were explicitly opposed to dualistic thinking. That was the whole point. Yes, that was my point. Dialectical thinking okay. is but an oxymoron. Because it's not di dualistic you thinking. Off, you said we cannot think except in terms of dualism. Yeah, one of the reasons why we have this crisis on the planet is that we thought dualistically, not dialectically. So you're saying two different things. But why should we believe what you've lectured today if you're not you some have kind of the... rational person? Who are you who lectured well, today to us point. and you want okay. to believe, uh, I, for us I, to believe did, this? Did I, did, I, did I take your money or trick you somehow? No, 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 of but, course you didn't take any who money. Are you? you called it a trick. But as, uh, as, you you, know, uh, as you lecture, so do people want to hear the lectures. So this is not the one-sided thing. You, you do like to do this, or at least like to do this, I don't know what your uh, um, I'm sorry, but I, I'm finding this are. slightly entertaining, uh, because uh, I didn't come here to trick people. I'm not being paid for this. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here. Uh, I have uh, no uh, particular uh, attitude about myself. Uh, I'm giving you a perspective to think with. I'm not giving you the truth. I've never claimed to give the truth. I don't know the answer to many questions. I'm, I'm trying to think through things and tell you some things that have been happening in science and other areas of thought that can allow you to think differently, not the correct way. So maybe you're projecting onto me uh, some psychology that you're captive to. But uh, I didn't come here to trick anybody. And the opening question, I'm sorry, was innocent. And it was designed for a purpose of getting us to talk about who are we, or humans, what is the human. That's all. Another question. Yeah, yeah well, first, thank you for a great speech. I think it is uh, in line with the current uh, processes that are happening around us. But I just have a really innocent question. Because the colleague said that you were banned from the United Kingdom. Yeah. I'm just really, really curious. For tricking people. For, for what was the reason for the ban? What did you say? So they banned you because I cannot. Well, it went from the innocent to the controversial. Uh, the innocent uh, was, uh, I said, remarks like, "One day we will wipe vivisection off the face of the earth." They thought that was violent. The controversial is that I, I defend the Animal Liberation Front. This is an underground criminal organization that breaks laws, destroys property to free animals who are captive slaves of exploiters. I find that fully justifiable and complete conformity with the best tradition America has, which is civil disobedience, the Boston Tea Party, the Underground Railroad of Harriet Tubman and in the abolitionist movement, the freeing of black slaves, the freeing of animal slaves, so uh, that is perhaps controversial to some people. To me, uh, it is uh, just simply morally sound. And you see, not many academics are going to take that kind of position in public because it's, it will threaten your career. As, as I predicted and as I uh, concluded, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you have to understand, I don't have a criminal record, and I'm ashamed of that. <laughs> Uh, I've never been caught in any Animal Liberation Act. I regret that. Um, I am a philosopher and uh, I use swords. My words are my swords, my words are my weapons. And uh, they didn't like my words. So I was going back and forth to England and giving lectures and leading demonstrations and having an influence on that movement there. The Animal Liberation Movement in England is one of the most powerful movements to ever emerge of any kind. And they were shutting down the pharmaceutical industry line by line, industry by industry, part by part. They shut down all the suppliers and breeders. They stopped a research building being constructed at Cambridge, almost one at Oxford. And uh, so pharmaceutical capital is the third leading contributor to the UK economy. So when the animal rights activists learn how to be effective and not stand there like this, 
holding up a sign. That's when the state's going to come down. My best friends in England are in jail for up to 10 years. You can murder, you can rape, you can get half that sentence. A crime of compassion. Myself and other people who have spoken out against uh, these hideous uh, uh, experimental uh, forms of torture an animal with no scientific purpose, no human value, uh, we have been banned from England. It's actually not very hard to be banned from England because it's a police state and all you've got to do is thumb your nose at them and you'll find yourself on the same list. So uh, it's purely a case of free speech that they kept me out of uh, all four of their uh, countries in the United Kingdom. Now an interesting footnote, that happened in 2005. I wanted to challenge that, it's been six years later, they've had three new governments, and I said, I am coming to give two lectures, uh, this was like uh, six weeks ago, and uh, I'm arriving at Stansted Airport Monday morning, 10 a.m., see you there. And uh, I didn't get a response from them. I said, uh, I wanted to remind you I'm coming. I don't want to sneak in. I don't play tricks. I want to sneak in. I wanted them to make a choice. Are you a democracy or are you a police state? Have you evolved or degenerated? So um, a, a, a note was released to the press about this. I never got past Poland. They stopped me at the Gdansk airport. They said, very nervously, sir, I'm sorry, uh, according to the UK government, you cannot fly on this plane. So uh, then they wrote me a letter and they, they said they uphold the ban, we reassert you are a threat to the public order. And I reply, you are a threat to the public order. You, as a fascist police state, support an evil, powerful industry that profits off the blood and murder of the innocent, and so long as there is no justice in your society, there will never be peace. Expect to lose sleep at night. <laughs> Just for a sub-question, how do you use your weapons words uh, in uh, your state of Texas, in your university? Do you ever have, like, because how this, you know, the students who believe in creationism or whatnot, it's like, do you have these issues or? Well, th theoretically, in a university, uh, yeah, particularly in America, we're supposed to have free speech rights. And when you have tenure, as I have tenure, uh, those rights are supposed to be protected. Okay. If you don't have tenure, you've got to shut your mouth for five or six years until you're evaluated, then you get tenure, then you have free speech. By then, you're used to the zipper on your mouth, and you never stand out. Plus, there's always promotion, right? So the, you decide right away, are you going to speak up for what you believe in, or are you not? And I always said, if Martin Luther King can lose his life, I can lose my fucking job. I'll find something else to do, OK? I'm going to stand up for what I believe in. My last book was on academic repression, 600 pages. 100 page introduction to the history of the suppression of free speech in America and American academic institutions, the rest all case study, including my own, written by someone else. Thank you. you don't write your own uh, story, right? So uh, I lost my position as department chair. I was said to be incompetent, uh, but they just didn't like my politics. They were worried that uh, I was going to bring a stain onto the university. Uh, I, was I was denied promotion to full professor. I have published over 13 books. I think that's enough. You know, some people do two in a lifetime. You know, I typically will get that out in a year. I think that's enough for a promotion. But no, I uh, somehow did not participate in enough committee meetings. Yeah. So you see, I, I, I paid the price. I knew I would pay. That's not important to me. Uh, what's important to me is to stand up for my principles and to fight for justice and to fight for the animals. You see, they want us to be afraid. They want us to be afraid. The FBI, the academic, uh, uh, academic industrial complex, it's, it's run like a corporation. It's infiltrated by the military and the security state. It's not an institution of higher learning. It's an institution of conformity and uh, social reproduction. Um, you learn to stand up uh, for your principles and fight what you believe in, no matter what the consequence. And I have my heroes, 
and, and, and I take my inspiration from them. Okay. My life is not in danger. My job is all the time. Every time I open my mouth, it seems to be in greater danger. But I don't fear losing my life because we're not at that advanced level of a war yet. And what we do, like in the Civil Rights Movement in the United States, Martin Luther King's home was bombed, Malcolm X's home was bombed, the young students that were freedom riders that organized to, throughout the South to sign up young blacks for voting rights, they were killed. Those are courageous people. So they want us to be afraid. The only thing I'm afraid of is letting the animals down. The only thing I'm afraid of is being afraid of speaking out. So do not let them make you afraid. And if you go into an academic career, be prepared to lose it any time <laughs> for having the principles to speak out. You're not even expected to be an activist. They, uh, you could be fired for uh, being cited in the New York Times for an anti-globalization rally. That happened to David Graeber, a very intelligent anthropologist in New York. They consider you not even a scholar if you are involved in activism, because a scholar has their nose in the book all day long. They don't put anything into practice. They do pure research. Well, I come from the tradition of the, uh, the, the, the committed intellectual, the public intellectual. Uh, the intel I am first and foremost a citizen, second a professor or a, or a writer. And uh, I therefore feel whatever small contribution I can make to be made as a citizen to the bio community. And I feel a really strong sense of obligation to that. And no academic industrial complex is going to stop me. Good to hear that. Thank you. Thank you for uh, coming to the seminar. And hope to see you on uh, Wednesday. We have another uh, lecture from from abroad. It's on criminology in the poll right there at uh, 5 o'clock.